in the in the world of graphite, our rods are s slower than most because of that progressive action. And so I think in that world, they're very different. But I think, you know, bamboo has more of an organic feel to it. And I think it's hard not to fit. It's hard to fish bamboo and not feel kind of a connection to the history of fly fishing. You know, we all grew up, grew up reading about chalk streams in England and, you know, all this kind of history to it. That was Joe Daub describing one of the benefits of their Tom Morgan rods. This is episode 161 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Please subscribe to the show and share it with one other person. Uh, if you get a moment today, that would be amazing, and I want to thank you in advance. The owners of Tom Morgan Rodsmiths are here today to share the Tom Morgan story and talk rod building. Joel Daub and Matt Barber share some tips on building a great rod. We hear about how you can stop by uh, their shop for some tips and discuss where they uh, might be going next with Trout Spay. This one's a good one, and it's been a little uh, time coming for sure, so excited to share um, this episode. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors. SoFly Gear, headed up by 17-year-old James Carlin of the U.S. Youth Fly Fishing Team, has a buttery, soft, quick-drying apparel line that I've been loving. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash SoFly and support James and the podcast. The Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has an exceptional fall edition that's out right now. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash FTJ to support the great work Craig and the gang have created just for you. So uh, again, that's uh, wetflyswing.com slash FTJ and, uh, and wetflyswing.com slash SOFLY for SOFLY. Uh, be great if you can do that. That would help, uh, help us uh, assure we keep pumping out uh, plenty of content without further ado here is matt and joel from tom morgan rodsmiths.com how's it going guys great how you doing doing well thanks it's uh it's great to have you on here uh we your name the tom morgan name i uh you know i think i've heard about it obviously i think maybe not everybody has learned about it so we're going to dig into a little bit of the background there on tom morgan and how it all came to be and how it's known as one of the one of the great, you know, fly rod companies out there. But maybe before we uh, get started, can you guys just talk each kind of briefly about how you got into fly fishing? Sure. Uh, this is Matt. Um, I started as a young kid. I grew up back on the East Coast, and my my great grandfather had a place up in the Berkshires of Massachusetts, and I started throwing poppers for largemouth bass at a really young age uh, with an old beater fiberglass rod. And uh, obviously, if you catch a largemouth bass on a popper, you're you're pretty much done from there. It's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, similar. I, I grew up uh, west of Denver um, on a little pond kind of in what is now sort of suburban Denver, um, just fishing for bluegills and, and bass and got my first fly rod when I was about five and kind of hiked around the, the foothills of Denver fishing as a kid. Um, I got pretty, pretty addicted to it. My grandpa was a fisherman. My, my parents were not. So my dad would just drive me to streams and take a nap in the car while I fished, but was lucky to have some early mentors and my grandfather that kind of got me into it and kept me going. That's cool. Yeah. The, the stories are awesome. You know, I mean, it's it, some guys, you know, get started as a young, you like you guys, some start older. One of the interesting things, I can't remember who I was talking about talking to, but we were talking about Tenkara and it's, it was interesting because, oh, I know who it was. It was George Daniel, who I had on a while back. And I was re-listening to that episode I had with him. Um, and he mentioned that he thought Tenkara was a great way, you know, to get his kids into fly fishing. And I just curious, what, what's your guys' take on the tin car? And obviously, I know I don't think you guys make tin car rods, but do you guys have a perspective on that? Yeah, I, you know, I haven't personally fished a lot of tin car, but uh, I, I do have a six year old. And starting young, I mean, I essentially tighten down the drag, give him as much line as I think he can't get in trouble with. And uh, he, he pretty much fishing it like a tin car rod. So I yeah. for sure see that, that simplifying it, um, you know, there's a lot of appeal to that. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I think I grew up fishing a 13-foot bamboo pole with just a length of string tied to the end of it um, for bluegills. It's funny. We, we had some conversations with Tom about it, 
And uh, I think Tom was uh, maybe not the biggest fan of Tenkara. You know, we're such steep traditionalists because of what we learned from Tom and his wife, Jerry, and, yeah. and the team people here that make rods. I think, you know, we kind of think of it as anathema, but I think Matt's right. I think from a beginning standpoint, the less you have to manage from a line reel setup standpoint, the easier it is to kind of focus on fishing the fly and actually, you know, setting the hook and, and figure out where trout live and, and, and focusing your efforts there. So I think it's actually really useful in that regard for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I can't remember if you, you guys. I think you did mention uh, some similarities between you know your company and Patagonia on, on some of those. And Patagonia actually had they had a line of uh, Tenkara for a while, um, so that's kind of interesting. And I haven't actually dug into the Tenkara yet either. I think I will eventually because you know I think it'd be fun to check it out. But you know the steelhead thing is something that obviously is a big focus you know on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Now you guys haven't got into the steelhead. I think you, is your heaviest rod you have is a seven weight now. Yes, the seven weight's new. And so I think, you know, we get approached by people from from time to time about saltwater and and steelhead and and spay fishing. And I think the one thing that we kind of learned from Tom is that you pick what you do um, and and you just focus on really trying to do that as well as you possibly can. And so, you know, for Tom and from his lineage, he was a fishing guide in Montana, you know, and so our rods really are based on his experience fishing with clients. What they had a hard time doing was putting flies on a dinner plate to visible rising fish. And so our action, really everything we do is based on trout fishing in Montana. You know, and I think that it's pretty easy if you're a big company to, to try to make a, you know, a solution for everything that's out there. And we within our, within our lines and, uh, and try to focus on making the very best trout rods we can and, and not keep our focus or let our focus broaden too much past that. Yeah, that makes sense. So what's that seven weight like? Is that a, I mean, because you can use... I mean, I guess that's more of a set for heavier streamers and things like that. Yeah, it's funny, you know. So Tom, um, Tom did a, a fair amount of steelhead fishing, um, uh, steelhead, excuse me, steelwater, steelhead fishing um, in Idaho as as a younger man, and so he actually used some fiberglass rods that we make, eight weight single hand fiberglass rods. Um, and so certainly, you know, that was back kind of before the spay revolution hit, you know, in the seventies, sixties, and seventies out there, but. Um, the seven weight we actually make in two different versions. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much, but we, in the process of prototyping yeah. that rod, we found two different blanks that we really liked. One that's stiffer, and we kind of consider to be more of a kind of light saltwater bonefish kind of rod, and then one that's a little softer that's more of a progressive action trout rod. Um, so, you know, the softer one we like a lot for streamer fishing for trout here in Montana, um, you know, sink tip lines, and then the stiffer rod would be more your full sink tip or even, you know, light steelhead, light bonefish, light saltwater kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, because I think that seven weight would probably work great for summer steelhead, mm-hmm. especially, you know, something a little bit lighter, not going for the monster, mm-hmm. the bigger fish. Um, okay. And so and now how'd you guys, uh, I mean, Massachusetts and Denver, how'd you guys uh, meet and, and come into uh, where you at now? Well, yeah, I, uh, I lived in Denver for about 20 years and, and Joel obviously grew up there and we met in Denver. Um, so uh, fish around um, Colorado, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, um, and, and just fished a ton together. And uh, both of us were probably in similar places in our work life, you know, working our butts off, but needing a change, needing something with a little more substance. And uh, um, started talking with Tom and his wife, Jerry, about the company, and they had it up for sale. Uh, so Joel and I, you know, kind of, I don't know if we were serious at first, we started taking a look at it. And the more uh, you know, we fell in love with the company. They started courting us and we were courting them and kind of going back and forth. And, and uh, we, we moved our families up to Bozeman and uh, have been there for about three years. No kidding. Yeah. yeah, kind of admitted midlife crisis, both had young sons and we're trying to figure out a way to have a life where we could be outside more and not be on planes and not be working late and be home for dinner. And yeah. Bozeman is a pretty special place if you've ever been out here. Um, you know, the university's here, so the town is a pretty lively place. And the skiing and the fishing and the hunting access is pretty unbelievable. You know, and it's a it's a small town, but it has a great airport. And uh, it just checked a lot of the boxes for us. And then, of course, you know, we'll talk more about it. But you go and meet somebody like Tom Morgan and, and start talking to him about what he does and, and how he does it and hearing stories. And it's, it's pretty alluring um, as a place to live and work. Yeah, uh, that is cool. So yeah, let's get into that. So Tom Morgan, I mean, I've, I read uh, some, some of the stuff on Tom. I mean, I didn't know the background. Like I said, the only thing I knew about Tom Morgan, it's pretty cool. It shows you a lot about the company is that I knew they were one of the best, you know, the rod company, rod makers in, in the world pretty much. And, but other than that, I didn't know much. And as I dug into the story, yeah, maybe you can just talk about that because that whole thing, how he was had, you know, MS and, 
basically, I think for 17 years, uh, you know, transitioned uh, to where he didn't build any of the rods. Can you can you talk about how a little bit about the whole Tom Morgan story, where he came from, how he got into I think Winston and then into Tom Morgan? Sure. So Tom grew up in Ennis as a, as a kid, and um, his parents owned the L Western Motel, and he started guiding on Odell Creek and on the Madison and the Ruby and all around there, and learned those waters and uh, and really learned how to teach people how to fish by watching his clients and watching what they needed. Um, he went on to own uh, a fly shop in Ennis for, for a bit and uh, ran that for a while. And uh, in the early 70s, 1971, I believe, um, Winston was up for sale. And uh, Tom purchased Winston in San Francisco. Um, and we, we like to joke because people say, did you guys build rods before you owned the company? And we asked Tom that question. We said, nope, Tom, we're not professional rod builders. You know, I don't know about buying this company. He said, don't worry, I bought Winston. I'd never built a rod in my life, you know. And so um, so Tom uh, had Winston in, uh, in uh, San Francisco for two years uh, and then moved it back to Twin Bridges, uh, obviously where it's still located today, and ran it until the early 90s. Um, so a lot of those really – famous green sticks that came out of Winston were, were designed by Tom and, and the team there. And, um, and he worked side by side with the net and Glenn Brackett and, uh, just, you know, really a lot of that storied history of, of where Winston came from today. Uh, and in the early nineties, he sold it to David Andachi, uh, who still currently owns Winston. So it's, it's an interesting story. I think you're right. There's a lot of layers to it. So there's the kind of the aspect of Tom as the fishing guide and the fisherman, which I think really informed a lot of the choices he made when he started designing rods. But I think it's always interesting. We tell people this, and I, I love the example of it. You know, there are different rod companies out there, and I think it's always useful when you really get into it to think about the rod designers and the people that started those companies and where they come from. You know, and some people are, are, were more tournament casters and they have a different focus when they design a rod as opposed to somebody that's a fishing guide um, who really sees the challenges of fishing and, and design a rod with that in mind. And I think, you know, your background and your history and, and your, your knowledge base really informs the choices you make. And, and so I think here at, at Tom Morgan, we talk about it a lot. We make rods that are meant to be fished. Um, because they're designed to challenge to handle the challenges of fishing, especially the way we fish here in Montana. Um, and that's why the, design, the rods move the way they do. They flex the way they do and, and they're built the way they are. And that's just you know, Tom's history and background that really created that focus um, and was most important to him. So we talk a lot about, you know, feel um, and, and uh, loading the rods and protecting the tippet and how you fight fish and, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. A lot more than we talk about you know, butt power or casting distance or, or things like that, because they seem less important when you're actually fishing here. Um, not that those aren't important things in different environments. You know, if you're in Florida, you got to have the ability to, you know, to cast, you know, 80, 90 feet with, with one back, back cast. So, you know, just different environments. And I think that that's a really interesting thing to think about. And we're lucky that way because we don't make a lot of our rods. So we get to talk to people about how they fish and where they fish. And it's not that each action is customized for the client, but we like to think that each rod choice or, or the model they choose is customized for where they are and how they fish. Yeah. So after, I'll just give you a little bit of a run up there. So after, uh, selling Winston, Tom and his wife, Jerry, uh, he met his wife, Jerry, um, were, were living right outside of Bozeman, uh, and Tom developed MS and it was a pretty rapid progression that he went, um, to quadriplegic, couldn't, uh, couldn't use his hands or feet. So there's, I don't know if it's a misconception, but, uh, at Tom Morgan Rodsmith, Tom has never built one of the rods that, uh, that we sell, um, because he, he was paralyzed. So he taught his wife, Jerry, how to, uh, build rods. She is not a fisherman, had never built rods before. Um, and he taught her all of the individual steps. And one of the things while Tom was at Winston is he always wanted to make a rod and not worry about you know, the, the price as it related to wholesale rods and then the markups and things. He wanted to make what he thought of as close to perfect of a rod as you could have. So it meant the nicest cork, the, the you know, really special burls of wood, agate stripping guides, nickel silver hardware, custom engraved for him. Um, and he didn't want to be constrained by, you know, trying to churn out uh, thousands of rods a year to fly shops. So, He'd always had this dream of a small custom shop. And then when he was faced with 
the paralysis, it, it became a reality that they needed to find um, work to do for the two of them. So they started Tom Morgan Rod Smiths in the early 90s uh, as, as a custom rod shop. Um, and we currently make uh, bamboo, graphite, and fiberglass rods in a variety of two through eight weight, depending upon the material. It's interesting, though. I think that um, I think that you know one of the things that Tom I think is known for, maybe within the industry more so than without it, is I think his kind of obsession with quality. And I, I really don't know where that came from. I don't know if he was always that way, or if rod building kind of created that within him. Um, but he he had kind of a, a philosophy on quality that I think is is the hardest thing about building rods the way we do because um, I think he wanted every single step to be performed at the highest level of quality to to the point where you get maybe that the the sum is greater than the the whole of the parts you know what I mean like if you skimp anywhere along the line it makes a difference in the final product and I think Tom was kind of known in the industry especially when he bought Winston of, of saying you know these rods could be much nicer than they are and much higher quality. And so I think that was kind of a, a drive for him throughout his life is to figure out how can we make this the very, very best. And I think in a production environment, as Matt alluded to, he found that there were limitations there um, when it comes to, you know, the, the, the time you can spend on a rod, the materials you can choose, um, given the margin and the volume requirements. Um, and I think part of what what drove him in his sort of semi-retirement to build a custom shop was that idea that maybe he could try to build the perfect rod. I don't think that the perfect rod exists yet. You know, it's kind of one of those things that's more, um, more of an aspirational goal than a real goal, but it pushes you to make everything as good as you possibly can. Um, and I think for Tom, that was kind of his 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 journey. You know, and, and it's interesting. The story has so many layers to it. It's not only, you know, Tom, the rod designer. It's Tom, the husband and partner to his wife, Jerry, and how that translated into what they did and how they did things. And, and as he became more physically infirm, how his mental outlook on designing and exploring materials and writing about rod design and things like that increased as he was physically able to do less and less and less. Um, it's a remarkable story of a man and a husband and a rod designer kind of all wrapped up into one. Yeah. Yeah. And the story going back, you know, again, when he transition from Winston to Tom Morgan. So did you, and he basically, you said he didn't build any rods for Tom Morgan from, from the start or was that, or did he build some and then transition in, in as the, as the MS came on? Strong? No, they, I mean, I think the formation of Tom Morgan rods this was always an idea that he had, but it was necessitated by uh, his illness. So oh, um, gotcha. I, I think they created it in a way to work from their home to stay doing something that they were that he was passionate about uh, to create some income. Um, so it, it really was born out of necessity. Um, but he certainly, you know, as far as designing went, though, I mean, he he designed every single rod that we have and he built what he learned to do was to rely on others and, and create a really collaborative process. So for prototyping, he would have some trusted casters come in and cast in the front driveway and he would sit in his chair and watch how the rod flexed and get their feedback. And they knew the, the action that he was after. And then he would go back to the spreadsheets and using you know, voice to text, make alterations to the spreadsheets and the patterns and then have you know, new prototypes rolled and then go back at it again. So he wasn't physically casting them, but these are all of, of Tom's designs and the way that he thought trout rods should behave. Right. Wow. That, yeah, that is pretty amazing. And I was thinking about it earlier, the way it, it came together. So basically, you know, with you guys now, I mean, you've taken over this company. I mean, how do you how do you kind of live up to that expectation? Do you, do you see that as a big challenge for you guys and people? I'm sure from the outside are like, well, Tom Morgan's gone. How, you know, and I, and I compare it to kind of almost the Steve Jobs thing, right? Apple, it, it was all about this guy, Steve Jobs. He disappears. You wonder how does Apple make it? But how, how would you guys, how do you guys do yeah, it? Yeah, well, first of all, I think our market cap's a little lower than Apple. So we have <laughs> For sure. I'll answer to um, yeah, it's interesting. I think um, in some ways, I think we were helped by the fact that we'd never built rods before. So we joke, you know, any habits we have, either bad or good, are Tom and Jerry's habits. <laughs> so we don't really know yeah. a different way to do it. So we didn't have to overcome any bad habits or, or any other shortcuts or, or any of the other things we might have had to hadn't we been really seasoned rod builders. But I think you're right. We spent a lot of time the first year or two years even kind of answering those questions. And I think people wanted to see if the quality changed or if the product changed or, you know, we were really lucky that we were able to keep almost all the same vendors who supply our parts oh, yeah. that Tom had and over time curated into a list of really superlative suppliers. Uh, we were able to keep the same team of people that had worked with Tom for so many years. 
um, and learn from them um, kind of on a daily basis. And, and I think that they were pretty good about, you know, not letting us go, so to speak. They didn't really let us leave the house uh, and the shop that was in their house until they felt comfortable. We were making rods that were at or above the quality they had made them at. Um, so sometimes I think we joke, I, you know, I think we take it pretty seriously and maybe hold ourselves even to a more impossible standard because we don't know um, any other way to do it. Gotcha. How, how do you guys stay at, I mean, you're at this level, I think it's something, you know, if somebody puts an order in with you guys, it takes, depending on the rod, you know, a good, you know, six months or so, right, it's in that range. How do you guys, I mean, do you talk about the potential of increasing production? I mean, the, this whole scaling thing, right, when you think of companies, the the scaling, prov- uh, you know, process, you know, do you guys just avoid that? Or how, how do you, you know, what, what are your plans for the long term with this? So, uh, you know, I think that, it, we asked Tom that question and said, where is, how big can this go? And, and he said, I can't give you a number, but as you're building the rods, if you are finding temptation to cut corners or order inferior supplies, or you find the quality of the work going down, then you've reached that, that place. So we're really not looking to ramp up into, you know, massive production numbers and supply every fly shop in America with one of our rods. It just, it doesn't make sense from from the cost of materials and labor, and it and it's just not our company is is founded. Um, you know, so what we're doing is we're growing gradually. You know, we're we're making more rods this year than we did last year, and more rods last year than the year before that. Uh, but we're we're constantly keeping an eye on are are we stretching things? Is quality you know suffering? And and right now we're really happy that it's not. We we know that we have the ability to make some more rods in 2020 than we made this year, but we're not trying to, you know, exponentially blow that up. Yeah. And I think, you know, the answer is is long-term. I I don't think we ever see this being a really big company. It'll always be pretty small. might be a little bigger than it is now and we might grow really slowly, but I think for us, the most important thing is to make sure we maintain that, that story and that heritage and, and the way that Tom built rods. So I don't think that can ever really be done on a mass scale. Um, we still want to have contact with our customers and, and be able to make choices that are appropriate for them and have their feedback when we build rods. That's right. Yeah. Cause you, you guys know every customer, right. By kind of a first name basis when the rods are in there, you're working on them. And, and what is it like when you, you know, if you take, can you take, uh, you know, take us to your, you know, the, the factory floor. I mean, <laughs> what's it like when you open that door and, and you look at you guys, what, what do we, what would we see if we walked in there today? <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're sitting here today. It's not, uh, not, not this fancy factory. It's, uh, it's, you know, uh, it's a great spot here in Bozeman. Um, and we do it all in here. It's everything from the office to the, uh, bamboo production to every step of the build process is all happening here under one roof. Um, there's five of us that, that work in the shop. Uh, and we really made it a focus to all be cross-trained so that no one person is responsible for just one step of the process so that, you know, we can kind of keep from getting bored and bounce in and out of, of doing the work we do. Um, but the process is, you know, for example, yesterday we, we took some orders on rods and, and we're working with that customer, sold a couple eight foot four weights. Um, and they were, you know, we were talking about handle shape and handle length and what color the blank will be. Cause we, we do it in either a red or a clear coat. Um, we talked about species of wood for the, for the real seat hardware, for the real seat, and then and then the type of hardware, um, what kind of inscription our calligrapher is going to do. So there's a really personalized approach to designing that rod, and even backing up and getting to the specific length and weight. We're talking. These were actually a couple of customers from Japan that I took out for a day of fishing this summer, and they tried a bunch of different rods and landed on the one that they wanted for the type of fishing that they do. So you know, we're really uh, really involved talking with our customers. Luckily, we've fished a lot of rivers and know, for the most part, where they're fishing and type of fishing they're doing. Um, so it's a really personalized process. Yeah, the Japanese rods are interesting because they fish for a small trout there called the shaku, I think it is. And they wanted a, we do a 20-inch fish mark on a lot of our, almost all of our rods. Oh, yeah. They wanted a 300-millimeter fish mark which is like, like 11 and 5 eighths inches or something like that. Oh, so yeah. so we, we figure out a way to do a mark that's for there for that type of little fish that lives in the mountains of Japan, I guess. That's the that's the goal is a 300 millimeter fish. So yeah, we figure out a way to do that. But I would say on any given day, you're going to find Matt and I either on the phones, 
either returning messages, doing sales, or on some part of the build process, you know, coating rods, building handles, you know, shaping bamboo. Uh, we kind of do all rod building stuff and, 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 and uh, more ownership duties, what you might think of. Um, and everybody kind of cross trains, as Matt says, it's funny to think of it as a factory. It's really, we call it a shop. Oh, yeah. It's funny that everything does come out of here and we try to do as much as we can here. And then obviously from a vendor standpoint, we start looking for vendors in Montana and then we look in the West and then we kind of look nationwide, but we really work hard to make sure all of our stuff comes from America. Yeah. Yeah. And, and is the other, and now the five people. So now is Jerry still uh, building rods? She's not, uh, she, she's happily pursuing her art, which is really was her passion before building rods and, and continues to be. Uh, but I was just on the phone with her yesterday, asking her a question about, uh, one of the vendors and in, in, in the manufacturing process for one of our parts. So, um, she's still very much in a consulting role comes by the shop when she's in town getting groceries and things and, uh, helps us out. But as far as day-to-day production goes, um, as Joel talked about earlier, they really had this philosophy of gradual release where they taught us each step until we could do it as well as she was. And then when we could master that step, then we stepped into that step and she continued the other parts of the build. And it wasn't until uh, she and Tom were able to look at a rod and say that they couldn't tell if, if Jerry had built it or if we had built it that they let us fly and move out of their home shop. Like I said, the, the stories there are more of the deep, deeper dive. I'll, I'll put a couple links. But as far as the building of the rod, can you just walk us through, you know, maybe a few of the, you know, kind of some tips, you know, and I've, I'm going into right now, I'm starting to build a couple rods that are, you know, on the side. I'm, you know, doing a little process here. And it's interesting because I haven't built a rod in probably 20, 20 years or more. Yeah. In, you know, and it, it's still a little bit of a, you know, there's a little bit of a struggle on some of the things, but can you give me, you know, maybe just some tips on how, if, if somebody was building a rod, how they might, you know, how you guys started off and go through that process really quick? Sure. Um, you know, I, I'll jump into some of those tips in a second, but one thing I want to back up, Tom was a huge um, helper of anybody that reached out to him. People always said they were surprised about how much information he offered and that he didn't keep a lot of his tips and tricks close to the vest. So, um, you know, people would write to him and say, how did you do this? Whether it was a bamboo build or a graphite build. And he <coughs> happily you know, talked about dimensions and techniques and things. And uh, so we've tried to keep that alive. One of the things that we started uh, about a year and a half ago was teaching bamboo rod building classes where folks come out to the shop and uh, in groups of uh, max size of about four people, they'll spend a week in our shop and go from calm to rod and use one of our tapers and, and end up with a you know fishable rod by the end of the week. So we, we both are building custom rods for customers, but also really uh, pursuing the education around building. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, I think one of the biggest things that stands out in my mind, Tom, there's a lot of sayings that we have around the shop that Tom uh, when he talked about building and one that sticks in my mind is he used to say, you know, don't hold on to a mistake just because it took you a long time to make it. Um, and in rod building for me, that's especially true. If, if I've been working on a handle and I glued up the cork and it's on the blank and I'm working on it and I look at it and it's just proportionately not right. And it's, it's now too small. Um, you know, I think there's a tendency to say, man, this took a lot of hours. It's going to be a huge pain to cut it off and start over. And so one of the things I really try to internalize is that if it, you know, if it's not done right, it's not worth doing. So, you know, we, we've been known to, to set ourselves back a couple days on a build of a rod or even more, just correct something that probably the, the customer wouldn't even notice, but uh, it's important for us to, to chase that. Yeah, and we talk about that quite a bit. There's a, just a rod we just did that um, it's not even that the customer would notice the defect, but if you know about it, Tom kind of taught that. It, it, you know, if we see it under magnification, it might be very hard for somebody else to find it, but if we know it's not right, it's kind of that, you know, you have to be true to that to that feeling, you know, true to that knowledge. And and so we, you know, oftentimes have to disappoint customers by saying this rod's not right, you know, we're going to have to start it over, or, but that's kind of what we do. You know, we know that's 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 our niche is to make sure every rod's as perfect as it can be before it leaves the door. Yeah, and do you guys do mostly, I mean, are you, are you doing four-piece? Uh, I mean, do you do two pieces? What Do you guys mix things up there? I think one of the unique things is uh, the way Tom designed the blanks is that they start out 
and, and they can be built as I, I fish a, a two piece, nine foot, six weight here in Montana when I'm out, you know, on some of the bigger rivers. And I don't know a lot of companies making a, a, a two piece, nine foot rod, but since we're lucky not to have to get on the airplane, uh, we prefer two piece when we don't have to fly, but certainly recognize that that's not the reality in the way most of the rods today are, are sold. So uh, we, we can make them in two or four piece. Yeah, we sell a lot of two piece rods for people here in Montana or have places here. And they're just, it's, it's just a sweeter rod. You have to do more if you're going to put, you know, two extra joints in a rod. It, it changes the blank more. Does it change, uh, I mean, the action considerably, just your two feet, your two piece versus the four piece? I think in our rods, you know, if you're fishing a rod that's a really stiff rod through the butt and for most of it out to a tip flex, you don't notice it as much, but Tom's design philosophy was to start with the finest tip possible and then have an even rate of progression all the way back to the handle. So when we're prototyping a rod, even up in like a six weight, if it doesn't load deeply from the tip to the handle, um, you know, and, and you can't feel it load at 25 feet, uh, then it's not one of our rods. So for us with a rod designed to bend like that and to, to fish like that, then two more ferrules is noticeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an okay. interesting point that makes about when we when we prototype rods, one of the very first things we ask when we ask our test casters is to start casting at 25 feet. You know, don't pull out to 50 or 60 or 70 feet to get the rod to line yeah. up. We want to feel that rod close because uh, so much of, of your fishing is 25 to 40 feet for trout. You know, you're not it's not really a distance game consistently. So um, we want to make sure that that those rods are are responsive and, and have feel close that we know they're going to load out. Uh, longer and we're not going to put a heavy line on them we're not going to you know kind of get any tricks yeah. to try to load them close because for us that feel is the most important thing gotcha no that, that makes total sense i, I want to go back to the rod building i think that rod building class sounds like an awesome resource so you guys is that something similar to your rods right if somebody orders a rod it's going to take a while to get it i mean how do you get into that class is that something where they can go to your website they call you up yeah, on the website, you know, we we just published our 2020 dates, so we're we've got dates out through August right now, and, and we actually have openings in all of those classes. So uh, if if someone's interested and uh, the dates fit, you know, we're offering pretty much one a month uh, to come out for the week and do it. Um, so definitely something to look into. Uh, but coming back around, you know, it, as a aspirational rod builder, I think uh, one of the things for me is, is in terms of shaping handles is I would get a, you know, a mandrel and start with shaping handles off the rod and just start messing around on the lathe and, and mess up and, and uh, play with different shapes and see what happens. And before, you know, it really matters. Um, you know, one of our philosophies is rather than buying preformed handles, pre-shaped handles and sliding them onto the rod, um, you know, Tom had us, drilling out each cork to match the taper of the rod and then gluing each cork onto the rod. So it connected with the blank connected with each other. And then we shape each customer's handle individually. So um, there's a lot more consequence to messing up on a handle once it's been glued to the rod. So I would start with messing up some handles off the rod before having to cut them off. So yeah, maybe we can just take it back really quickly to the process on the actual rod. So before you even get into putting the handle on, you know, everything there, can you talk about first, you know, just the basics, the, the mandrel, can you talk about that process and where your blanks, how, how that comes together, what a mandrel is just kind of. Yeah, sure. Out. So if you're not familiar with, with how we make uh, graphite and fiberglass blanks, basically um, there's some choices you make when you're making rods. And, and we've alluded to that kind of in the pattern. And so we call the rolls of graphite or fiberglass fabric. And so you take that roll of fabric and you cut it essentially like a sailcloth. So at the butt end, it's wider. Um, and at the tip end, it's narrower. It's essentially tapered like a sail on a ship. Um, and the way you cut that can make a lot of difference in, in the way the rod turns out. Uh, basically, that cloth is then tacked with an iron, essentially, um, onto a mandrel. The mandrel is a long steel tube with a constant rate of taper. Um, and then that, that fabric that's wrapped onto the mandrel is then wrapped on the outside with cellophane tape under pressure. Um, and that creates a, a little bit tighter adherence to the mandrel. And then that whole thing is baked in an oven. And that's what sets the resin content in the fabric and makes it stiff. Uh, then it comes out of the oven and then you use a, a pneumatic raw or a mandrel puller that pulls the mandrel out and you're left with the hollow cylinder of the cured resin fabric. And so the choices you make, you choose a lot of things in the fabric. You choose what type of resin and, and the, the thread count or the, the fabric area weight that you want for certain things. And then the flag pattern dictates the amount of overlap 
that you're going to have once it's rolled on the mandrel. Um, and there's things you can do with compounding tapers and, and all different. It can be about as complicated as you can imagine. So there's different things you can do. You can mix materials. Um, you know, you can have a, a different material at certain parts of the rod or over the ferrules and things like that. You can reinforce internally where the ferrule points are. There's a lot of things you can do to, to change that resulting action. You know, we're really lucky in that we learned from Tom um, and we have the, the, the benefit of having Tom's patterns that over decades he honed, you know, that that sense of knowing what a number translates to, to uh, in, a, in a rod flex and feeling of the rod is, is really something I don't know if we totally have yet. That's decades of, of, of casting and prototyping rods to feel, you know, what the difference is in this overlap versus that or or this this taper versus that in the way the rod feels. And so, you know, we're, we're really lucky and, and proud to say that, you know, some of the rods we build are the same rods that Tom Morgan Rodsmith has been building for 25 years. You know, and Tom's philosophy on rods was good fishing rods don't become bad fishing rods. Um, and that's kind of part of our philosophy is we really feel like, you know, you buy a really good trout rod, you buy it once and you use it hard for a long time. You know, they, they don't roll over. Our model lineup doesn't roll over every three years. You know, we're not going to tell a customer the rod you bought 10 or 15 or even 20 years ago isn't still a really good rod. And we can, we're able to do that because we don't make a lot of rods. You know, we're, we're not, you know, making thousands and thousands of rods every year. So that's a, we're, we're kind of fortunate to be able to have that philosophy and, and stick to it. And now a quick word from our sponsors. The Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has a great fall edition that's out right now. You can find Lucas Stevens, who visits Winston Fly Rods in the fall edition, for an insider look and a rare interview with Ted Leeson. Patrick Wall pays homage to Harry Lemire's Tide in Hand Atlantic Salmon Flies displayed in the Marguerite Museum. Uh, Boots Allen takes us uh, to the pond with a master class in Stillwater. Dennis Dobble travels to Scotland in search of a salmon. Atlantic Salmon, plus uh, Deputy uh, Editor of the uh, Fly Fishing Tying Journal, Henry Hughes, has a mysterious fly fishing story, uh, plus much more. I'd love if you can stop right now, uh, just press pause, uh, and just head over to wetflyswing.com slash FTJ and subscribe uh, to the magazine, and you'll get that uh, that issue delivered right to your, uh, your mailbox. That's wetflyswing.com slash FTJ. Jay. We are also supported by SoFly Gear, led by Chief Apparel Guru and Team USA Youth Fly Fishing member, uh, James Carlin, who has a clothing line you're definitely going to love. SoFly's mission is to produce clothes that look good, perform well, and can be worn on and off the water. Plus, most importantly, are manufactured under rigorously sustainable methods. How do they do it? Bamboo, in a single word, a fabric that is buttery soft to the touch. Uh, durable, sun resistant, and highlighted with great artwork. I've been wearing the SoFly hoodie uh, pretty much all year now, and I, I just can't take it off whether I'm fishing or hunting. Um, it's pretty amazing, so you got to check it out. It really works great in all conditions. It's light, it's soft, all good. And I uh, just wanted to let you know uh, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash SoFly. Uh, that's uh, wetflyswing.com slash SO. F L Y to get started today. If you go to that link and show your support for the podcast, uh, you will assure that we will be able to create more content indefinitely and infinitely. Okay. Back to the show. No, that's, that's really cool. So that explains it. Thanks for, you know, clarifying that. So basically you, you get these, you know, you get the rod. I guess you have a local company that's building, you know, essentially making that. Yes, yeah, so we use a couple of suppliers. We use a couple of suppliers that roll our blanks. Um, we're not at the size where we can have our own blank rolling facility, unfortunately. We'd love it because from a prototyping standpoint, it's nice to just say, hey, let's roll this today and see how it casts. So it's a little right. more lengthy procedure for us. But, yeah, we own all the mandrels and the patterns. And so basically we pay somebody to make them uh, based on our specs okay. for the fabric and the resin and the patterns. Yep, and they supply them with us. Or and then, us. Yep. And then from there, you know, basically, you and I have talked. You've said I want a, you know, two piece, eight and a half foot, four weight, uh, and I want the red blank as opposed to the clear blank. So we coat the blanks in house, and then we will ferrule it. We use spigot ferrules for all of our ferrules, um, and uh, we'll ferrule it to the length and, and the number of pieces that that you're after and then we start through the process we depending upon if you want up locking or down locking hardware that determines where we glue the cork um and then we we glue the cork directly onto the blank tom thought that that made a difference for the connection 
from the casting and, and, and the playing of fish, translating down the blank through the handle into your hand by having a really tight connection. Um, we shape it based on your preferences. We start with either a Western cigar or a full wells as kind of our stock handles, but people send us drawings and measurements and pictures of favorite handles. So, uh, you know, that's part of that custom process. And then, uh, we wrap and, and have our calligrapher come in and, and she's a local here in Bozeman does a beautiful job writing whatever you'd like us to write on the rod. And then, uh, and then we go into coding and, and, uh, coding is another spot as a, as a, an aspiring rod builder. I think that, uh, you know, some tips from Tom are pretty helpful. Yeah. And I think so the process Matt just talked about, there's probably a couple of tips in there too. So I don't know as a home builder, I'm trying to think what's feasible, what we can give you tips that's yeah. feasible, feasible there. Well, what is, what is the difference between a, a home builder, say somebody that's just got this one rod they're building, they've got, you know, the basic setup versus what you guys have there when you're Well, building. I don't think from a technology standpoint, it's really that much different, but I can tell you like when we get blanks in, so we deflect every single blank we get. Because we want to make sure that it meets Tom's standard for the specific line weight, so we deflect tips and butts. Well, what's the, what's the uh, def, what do you mean by deflect? So deflection is basically when you hang you hang a standard weight on the end of the blank and it's held static on a board, and we can measure how deeply it bends with that oh, weight gotcha. for a tip or a butt. Now everyone's deflection board is different. You know, a different maker might have different weights. They might have a different like board. You know, so it really is only true to what we use for us. You know, it's like an individual thing, a deflection board, but we look at each tip and butt and make sure that they bend the way, let's say a five weight should bend for us, you know, for that pattern. And if it's too stiff, it gets rejected. If it's too soft, it gets rejected. If it's within a certain margin, a pretty tight margin, then the slightly stiff ones get matched with the slightly stiff butts. So the slightly stiff button tips go together and the slightly soft button tips go together and the dead on button tips go together. So we try to create a recipe between the two sections that maintains the, the uh, nice progressive action across them and then we record that for customers so we know if you know john edwards breaks his tip we know what his tip is at when we do his repair so we kind of you know every step along that way we try to take every single detail um, and quantify it so that it's not a mystery if we ever have to repair or rebuild that then we take those blanks very rarely are blanks perfectly straight so we straighten them and so you can straighten blanks by applying heat and pressure <clears throat> now we have kind of a, a doohickey or we call them organisms these tools Tom invented that we use for that. I don't know if a home builder would be interested in that, but is this different than the um, like the spline where you look where you find the spline and, and different than that? spline? Yeah. So so straightening for us is is sweeping curves, and that may or may not correlate to the spline. The spline's a little different, and, and Matt can kind of talk to finding the spline and our philosophy on splines. But the spline is basically the area of the maximum overlap. So if you think back to that pattern oh, right. where you overlapped it at one point in the rod where that that flag ends is going to be the most material overlap in the rod. And that creates the spline down the length of the blank. I, I don't remember. I'll have to dig it up. I can probably see if I can find it and forward it to you. But there was a great article maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, one of the builders at Thomas and Thomas was talking about this philosophy of finding the spline. And, you know, the, why I really liked the article was that there was a lot of consensus on how to find the spline, but almost no consensus on what to do with it once you did find it. So I thought, that, I, I thought it was great. They talked about, you know, Orbis's approach to using the spline and some people That's put it on the back and some on the, under the guides and some on the side for accuracy. And it, it's just a really interesting no, I love that because that's that's one of those things where I'm right now just find the spline to somebody as you know as listed there saying, well, you know, the spline's not important nowadays because you know the rods are pretty straight with a four piece rod. It's not that big of a deal, but you can, you know, you can hold the tip of the rod at least and roll it, and it'll snap and it'll show you where the spline is. But yeah, that's the thing. Where do you put the guides on the bottom or the top of where that spline is? It's kind of funny. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think there's a lot that goes into that. Everything, you know, we, we like to also talk around the shop about how everything matters and everything from Tom's guide spacing charts. So Tom's philosophy was to use smaller guide sets than probably a lot of the modern rods are. Um, he thought that it kept the line uh, from losing energy by chattering back and forth and, and kept it huh. uh, more in line when casting. Uh, the spacing between guides, you know, everything matters to how the rod feels. So I think, like Joel has said a couple times, we're really, really lucky that we got um, all of Tom's designs, you know, obviously as part of the company. Uh, but as we have played with prototypes and, and started to do some of our own work, we realized how every little thing from the amount of thread wraps, the amount of coating, the amount, the, the weight of the individual guides and the sum of the weight of those guides 
it, it all matters. It, it, um, it really does. And I, I used to think, you know, people were making that up or nobody can really feel that when it casts, but it, it really does matter. And Tom would say it matters more at the tip than it does at the butt, all those things. The more you do at the tip, it's a right. big, big long lever arm, you know? And so um, you do as little as possible. He would say that the blanks are perfect and the more you do to them, just messes them up. Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you keep, and then how, how would you determine the spacing? If you had that, say that eight foot four weight, you know, how would you guys determine? I mean, obviously you've built those before, so you could copy what you did before, but how, how would you determine the spacing or how would somebody yeah, determine Yeah, I think, it? you know, um, uh, Mike McCoy at Snake Brand Guides has a great chart. So if you buy guides or <laughs> REC, I'm sure has it as well. And, it, you know, if you, there are some generic spacings for an eight foot yeah. rod as a good starting point, you know, and generally the width between <clears throat> Uh, the tip top and the first guide, it's a little bigger between the first guide and the second guide and a little bigger between the second right. guide. You know, it really matters if you're building a two-piece rod or a four-piece rod and where you want those guides to fall in relation to, uh, you know, a reinforcing wrap around the ferrule. So sometimes you have to adjust them. But I think back to your your last question about what's different between a home builder's shop and, and our shop, and it's really – we just have a lot of jigs and a lot of purpose built machinery that's used for one step of the build process. And if I was doing this in my home garage, I could achieve a similar outcome, but I'd have to yeah. kind of get creative with some of my different tools. Um, I might not own a lathe, so I might turn a handle on a drill or a drill press or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas we have one lathe specifically set up only to turn handles and a second lathe only for ferreling bamboo rods and doing other you know, work in the shop. So that's where I think we're lucky for guide spacing. We happen to have some, some boards that have the, you know, original markings from when Tom and Jerry designed them and we lay the blank down <clears throat> on the board and then just use a, you know, a white grease pencil and go down and make marks where each guide should be. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Going back to the rod. So you guys basically, you know, you're building the rod like you normally, you, you put the handle on, although you guys mentioned you build the handle, you're not just sliding it over the down the blank and then what's the next step you guys go into do you, do you kind of go to the tip top and then start wrapping the guides yeah so i think uh so that yeah you know, we tip top the rod and there we're looking for straightness between, you know across the ferrules whether it's two piece or four piece um getting everything lined up uh often it corresponds with the spline but you know we're looking to make sure that that's straight when it fits together um and then as far as wrapping goes you know i don't know as far as tips to wrapping I find that when we do bamboo classes, that people who have done a lot of fly tying gravitate naturally to wrapping rods. It's it's similar fine motor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a whole lot of magic tricks there, other than patience. And you know, again, if you have a tag end or a double wrap, even if it's on an ornamental wrap, it's taking you a long time to do. You just gotta flick it off with your thumb and and. So you wrap that guide and then you, you know, get your loop of thread and stick it through and pull it through. To, is, do you, is that how you tie? How do you tie it off so you hide that little, you know, that little nip that you do with the razor blade? This is going to be really interesting for me to describe on a podcast. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Easy on uh, video, not on a podcast. Basically, I, I yeah. use a, a loop of 5X tippet that I've tied into a, maybe a three-inch loop and about five wraps out from the end. Now, again, with our level of, of precision – I measure every single wrap with a pair of calipers and so that oh, wow. every wrap matches and I count the number of wraps on everything. So it's either, I know it's exactly, uh, you know, 750 long, or I know that it's 20 wraps, then three wraps of brass and 15 yep. more wraps than three wraps of brass. So I either have counts in my head or, or measurements and I match the two wraps on the guide using calipers. Um, but I stop about five wraps short of the end, uh, put that loop of, of uh, 5X uh, onto the blank, and then continue to wrap those five wraps so that loop is wrapped underneath. And then yeah. when you cut the thread off of the spool, you drop it through that loop. And there's a couple different techniques, depending upon if I'm wrapping bamboo or graphite, uh, whether I just snug it up and pop it off or pull it all the way through. And that kind of sometimes depends on tips versus butts or um, if I'm teaching somebody new versus somebody that's done it a bunch. But yeah, basically you're just burying uh, the end of that thread under four or five wraps. Underneath. And, and why not, and why use the five X versus just using the thread you're wrapping with uh, an extra thread? You know, the, the five X to me 
is thinner. thinner, but it's also strong enough that I can use a loop of 5X, you know, all the way down a rod kind of thing without breaking it. Um, because when it breaks, you almost always have to redo the wrap. So that that's kind of a pain. Gotcha. Okay. And the other thing I, I'd say about uh, tip to building that we find is I'm either in the right mood to wrap or I'm not. And if I wrap a rod when I'm not in the right mood, it doesn't look great. You know, so I, I think like anything, whether it's sitting down to tie flies or, or sitting down to shape the handle, like don't force it. You know, obviously we have to build rods and don't have the luxury of saying this week I don't feel like it. But I try to look at different parts of the day when I'm when I'm feeling like my eyes are good and my hands feel good and I'll jump on and wrap. Uh, but if I'm exhausted or, or feeling impatient, it's not the time to sit and try to do that. That's right. That's right. Are you guys? I'm not sure. I'm not sure your age, but are you guys uh, have uh, glasses and stuff like that? Are you at that level? <laughs> Reluctantly, yet? Uh, we're we're both in our young forties and. Uh, uh, I, are fighting the readers. Yeah, I know <laughs> you're not, you're not far away, man. I'm telling you, you got a few years. You're going to be stuff. But I, I still, man, I, 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 when I put them on, it's just, it's a world of difference, but I still avoid it because I'm like, no, I'm not going there yet. <laughs> this season. I, I, I'm like embarrassed to say I'm that guy now out with those click on, uh, the ones click together, yep. you know, to tie the knots on my flies. And I, I use them when I'm wrapping rods. We also use uh magnifying, uh, you know, like the kind that go over your head, oh, yeah. uh, the magnifiers, yeah. uh, quite a bit at, at different steps in the process. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I was just going to say, so after wrapping, you know, we go into coating and my first tip I had for you about coating is I do everything under magnification yeah. anymore. Like I, I just, you see the edges so much better. You see the margins so much better. You can assess whether there's, you know, whether it's good or it's bad or there's a bubble or, you know, all those things show up yeah. so much easier when you're using magnification. So we pretty much constantly do that, you know, for two reasons to make sure the quality is really there. And then we also feel pretty good if you can't see it with magnification that you're not going to see it when you're fishing or when you're looking at your rod when you get it or, or something like that. So we use lots and lots of magnification and, and we do, we do coating a little different too. So, you know, we use a, a flexible epoxy resin for our coating, but we do a lot of coats. Um, so I think most production places are doing maybe one or two coats and we typically do, you know, five to seven coats, uh, very thin coats and we sand between coats. So we look for little defects or, uh, bumps from tag ends. You sand, you don't use a razor blade to cut off. You know, one of the things we found with razor blades is, um, if you razor blade them, you can actually create a flat defect that can reflect the light. So you'll see, oh, uh, right. uh, you know, so that's a, you know, it, it may work fine for the home builder. We don't, we didn't want that. So if you do use a razor blade, I'd say you need to sand after you use the razor blade. So, oh yeah. You know, in some ways it's easier to just sand. <laughs> and, and, when we're, gotcha. and to be clear, when we're talking about sanding, you know, we're talking about 1500 to 2000. Yeah. Sand. Very, very fun. Oh, right. We're not sitting there with 80 grit. You very, know. very fun. <laughs> yep. yep. So, um, yeah, so we do lots of coats and coating press. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, it's done when it's done. And there's a couple of parts of our process that aren't really entirely quantifiable. You just kind of know what the look is you're looking for. And, and you can look at it and say, this is done and this isn't. And it may have been seven coats, sure. it may have been five coats. And it just kind of depends on the day. And sometimes at the end of the pot, the epoxy is a little thicker and the beginning it's thinner. And so there's a lot of things that go into that. We also um, always recommend heating your epoxy a little bit. So we just use a flex coat epoxy. But if you can get it to about 100 degrees, it just handles much better. Uh, mixes mm -hmm. better, works better on the brushes. We use nice brushes, so we don't use disposable brushes. We use nice brushes and clean them because we feel like the, the nicer mm -hmm. brushes have better bristles, fewer air bubbles. What kind of a what, what would be a nice brush? Oh, like steel something. brushes. You know, brushes that are like five or seven bucks instead of 27, 25 cents. Oh, okay. You know, so that gives you an idea. And, and different people like different sizes of brushes. We tend to use pretty small brushes because we like to be able to really detail the edges and, you know, get things really even and flat. And so the idea of the multiple coats is it just gives you a flatter finish. So when you're, out, you're yeah. always battling footballs and uh, and dumbbells, like they want to yeah. turn into a dumbbell. Um, and, and if you don't have a dumbbell, then you get too thick in the middle, it turns into a football. So, you know, you're kind of going back and forth. And we're, we always try to create a really flat, flat surface um, that doesn't really stand out too much from the rod. Gotcha. And are you guys spinning this to, to dry it or is that yeah, something that's we are. So, yeah, we chuck it on. A, another difference between a, a home shop and ours might be we just – we chuck things on a motor to coat them with the brush and then we yeah. spin them on a drum. 
Yep, and that just keeps it so that it dries nice and flat and even. You know, if you, if you were to hang something to dry, yeah. obviously the epoxy is still curing, so it sag towards the floor because of gravity. So we rotate them on a drum. Usually, you know, three, four hours, it'll set up pretty good on you. Varnish is a little different with the bamboo rods, so we rotate them a little bit longer. Um, but I think, you know, the coating stuff, like Matt said, it's, you kind of got to be in the right mood. And, and, you know, if you're not in a good mood or you're hurrying or rushing, inevitably you'll touch a wet part or bang it in the wall or, you know, something happens and you're better off to just take a break. And I think a lot of it's just about detail, you know, the magnification and the sanding. And I think the key probably to getting good finishes is the sanding probably even more than the coating. You know, it's how you clean up things and, and move on to the next step is probably most important. Um <clears throat> And then you get really familiar with epoxy too, just knowing how it behaves and when it's ready and when it's not, and when it's done, and when it's, you know, you kind of get all those things down just by practicing and using it quite a bit. Gotcha. Okay. So, so other than wrapping now, you know, I mean, you put the real seat on, you get that all set up, you know, anything else that you guys, you know, do differently that, you know, through the process, I guess you have a, a hook uh, keeper up there too as well. We, we offer a hook keeper. We find, I think as people have gravitated to longer leaders that, a lot of our customers actually don't prefer them because you end up winding the, the leader up to the tip top. So most of our cus- customers actually opt out of those. Um, and then, you know, I, like I, I think back to a lot of finished woodworking where it's easy to get 80% of the job done and all the devil is in the sanding and the finish work. And it's similar in rod building. There's a lot for us that, you know, it, it really is at the end steps of the process. Um, we buff those, those, uh, all, all the coats, uh, on a buffing wheel. Um, uh, we're, we're doing some really fine sanding. We're, you know, dressing up any kind of possible defects. So it, it comes back into why back to your earlier question about scaling up. I, I wouldn't know how to build 200 rods a month, uh, the way we do it. I, I just don't think it's possible. Uh, at least, at least not for me and not, not for, I don't want to work, you know, year, you know, around the clock seven days a week here to do that. Um, so I just don't think it's possible. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's really about how you, the fit and finish. And then, you know, good example, we had a rod built for a customer the other day and it wasn't structural. There was just a little air bubble in under the name badge. Um, and we fought it and fought it and Joel's tried to sand it back and get it done at the end of the day, we couldn't get the air bubble out. And we told the customer, you know, we're going to build you an entirely new butt. Um, and we're going to, we're going to start over. We'll ship your rod to you so you can go down to Argentina and fish it. Uh, but you'll have a new butt coming in the mail. Uh, and that for us, is, you know, it's not cheap for us to do that, but it's important that that rod is as close to perfect as possible. And chances are he would have never seen that air bubble. No, uh, well, no probably no. if I looked at most of my production rods that are down in my basement, they probably all have air bubbles somewhere, but it's just important to us that, that we knew and uh, we're just not going to, not going to send one out like that. Right. Right. What's the, so on the, on the real seat, uh, what's a k- typical type of wood? It sounds like you guys use some different types. Is, what species is the most common? Yeah. Tom was a wood collector. So yeah. One of the things he used to do in the mornings, he'd sit on his computer and bid on <clears throat> blocks of wood, blanks. Oh, I guess, wow. Usually I guess guys that were building pens or knives because uh, they're similar type blanks. For, uh, for rod <laughs> seats, but we work with probably about 20 different kinds of wood. Um, we usually start off by saying, you know, like light wood or dark wood. So we have a lot of the traditional maples, you know, like tiger stripes and bird's eye and and, uh, and box elder and things like that. We do a lot of stuff with burl woods, which tends to be more highly figured and has a lot of swirling kind of patterns to them. I think the most popular wow. woods probably for us are, oh gosh, I don't know, Emboin is a pretty well-known, you know, darker burl wood. Um, we have some kind of less common species like Sapel, which is an African hardwood, really beautiful briar. Um, we've got some really neat kind of spalted stuff now. So spalted means wood that has a fungus in it, which tends to make it have kind of gray streaks or black lines in it. Um, so we've been doing some spalted box elder and some spalted maple burls that are really beautiful lately, but it just kind of depends. We usually give people a choice of eight real seats. Um, if they express an interest, you know, if they say I want box elder, we'll send them eight box elder seats. If they say I want dark wood, we'll give them, you know, eight different dark wood options. And then they actually pick the real seat that goes on their uh, on their rod. And so that's something we make in house, too. So we buy the burls and, and section them and, and uh, fortify them and then turn them on the lathe and, and slot and mortise them for the real seat hardware. So um, that's something we do here. And, and I think it's kind of fun because that's your interface with the rod. And so some of our customers get really into the idea of you know, having a special handle on a special real seat and you know, a special inscription. And that's kind of, you know, makes the rod really individual for them. I think one thing, though, I, I do want to 
just circle back to, because I, I find myself doing this at fly shows and stuff, or when people come through for a tour of the shop, I spend like ad nauseum. I'm so proud of the you know quality of our work and the fit and finish and, you know, all of it. But I think one of the things that I come back to is I've, it, we could do all that. And then if you went out and strung up the rod and put a line on it and, and it didn't cast great, you know, that doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter how much quality you put into the component parts if it's not a great rod. And I think one of the things I, I, I want to come back to is just to talk about that design. You know, Tom's adherence to a, a rod that had an even rate of taper that loaded all the way to the handle. You know, we're seeing more and more, whether it's Winston coming back to the pure sage with the LL that did really well this year at the shows. Um, you know, I think that people are realizing that rods, especially for fishing, fresh water and trout rods specifically got too stiff and, and you lost that connection, lost that feel. And yeah, at the show, you know, you could cast 80, 90 feet and feel like a hero, but that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, Tom's philosophy was that trout fishing is 45 feet away. And if the trout are farther away, then do a better job stocking and getting closer and, and then, you know, fish to them. But it, it's <clears throat> really, I think important to protect tip it with a soft tip um, and to have a rod that is really accurate and has a really delicate presentation, uh, especially as waters are getting more and more pressured and crowded and fish are getting more and more picky. You know, I, I find that I prefer a rod that is really delicate and precise over a cannon because I, I just feel like I catch and land, uh, more fish that way. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think that's exactly right. And do you guys feel with your rods, do you feel uh, a flex in, in the actual handle? Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you the difference on our rods. If we build a handle that has 12 cork or 13 cork, making it either a six or a six and a half inch handle, that extra cork is actually changing the point at which the rod is flexing. Uh, and I can feel it be a hair stiffer with a little bit longer handle. Um, and so they're definitely bending all the way down to the handle. Yeah, we talked about having kind of a, an action that has kind of a lively mid or lively butt. So you feel them instead of them having the absence of feel, if that makes sense. Yep, that does. No, and I think you're right, uh, Matt, You the point you made. I remember that as things were, it seemed like it was all about, you know, the rod companies were coming out more and more, you know, faster, faster, faster. And then it seemed like everybody stopped here in the last five or 10 years. It, it, was, it just kind of thought like, wow, what do we have now? We've got this super stiff, super fast rod. And, like, and I kind of like a soft rod. You know, I think people are starting, I think you're totally right on that. I think one thing too that, Joel and I both really believe in and Tom believed in is, you know, rolling over different lines, you know, coming up with different models of rods just to stimulate customers. It, it, it doesn't feel good, you know, have people own a rod for two years and then be told that that rod doesn't work anymore and they got to buy the newer one. And, you know, his philosophy was build it once and build it really well and make it something you can hand off to your kids, not something that you fish for a season or two and then replace and, you know, it's yeah. an environmental piece around the waste of going through that. There's for me, you know, to buy a seven or eight hundred dollar rod and then two years later sell it quickly on Craigslist so I can buy another seven or eight hundred dollar rod. It, just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel right. So, you know, we have yeah. customers that will come back six or eight years later and say, I have one of your nine foot five weights. You know, did you guys come out with something new? Should I buy something new? And we say, nope, we're still building the same nine foot five weight. Uh, you know, hope you love yeah. it. Uh, you know, maybe you'd like a eight foot four weight or, a, you know, something different, but we're not going to try to resell you a five weight just because we're going to try to make another sale. Because it's the newer. And, and I think that is the Patagonia. I think you guys had noted before, that's the, the mentality of Patagonia and, and, uh, what they do, you know, they try to, you know, even they have repair days. I think up, I just saw, you know, they have days where you take your stuff and they'll repair it for free, you know, in, instead of buying and creating more stuff. And, and I, you know, I have a personal note, you know, I've talked a little bit about this, but I grew up kind of around a fly shop and it was, we had a small fly shop. It was tiny and, you know, we didn't do a lot of sales, but I remember the pressure was always, man, you got to get, get the rods out the door because there's a new one coming in next year. And, and since we didn't sell a lot, it was always a pressure. I think we missed our mark. We should have connected with, uh, with you guys back in that day. <laughs> I think that would have made it easier. You know, I think some companies too want you to own two weight through 12 weight of their company. Right. And I think back to the, your questions originally about steelhead, you know, our philosophy isn't, we're going to try to be every rod for you, but Take that one time, you know, for single hand trout fishing, 
where you like to throw dry flies or you want that presentation and pick that one rod and have that be your special rod on those days. And then there is a time and a place, you know, when it's blowing 25, 30 miles an hour on the Yellowstone that you want, you know, a really powerful five weight and you might not fish our rod that day. Um, so we're not trying to take over your whole quiver, just be the one really special one in there. Or two. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, we're, you guys, uh, we're about going to wrap this thing up here. Before uh, before we jump into a quick little rapid fire round, do you have any any other notes we missed here? Anything you want to cover as far as action or any anything there? No, I think this was great. Yeah, I think we covered just about okay. everything we had to say <laughs> in an hour. Perfect. We'll more, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I know. No, there's no way to cover an hour. So, uh, well, so I guess we'll start off with that space. So, you know, you guys, it sounds like you haven't. Uh, yet built a rod of now have you guys built a rod on your own or is it you're still using all of tom's old stuff and do you have plans to to eventually build something that's more of your what you, you know you two create so i think for sure that there's two rods both both the seven weight and uh our eight foot four weight were designs that that tom worked on until he passed away but that never got rolled into prototypes so those are two rods that uh, I, where I feel proud that Joel and I have been able to put our stamp on the final product because we launched off of Tom's plans, but still had to go through different iterations in the prototyping and come up with a final rod. So I think we're really proud to develop those. And um, while we're not going to redevelop, you know, an existing model of Tom's, I, I do think <laughs> that, um, you know, we've played around with the idea. I had a customer that is really interested in us building a, a bamboo trout spay rod. And, and I've been kind of noodling in my head about what that might look like. And so, I think some new designs for us um, uh, are definitely on the horizon, but I don't think they're going to be at the expense of the the tried and true rods that we have. Gotcha. Okay, so there's no, yeah, like you said, there's no, there's no plan for a trout spay rod anytime in the in the near future for you guys. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe out of bamboo. What's what's near, what's near okay. future mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, that's well, that's a good question. So on the bamboo, so you know, I would say, let's take I would, both. Let's I would start. say to be fair, I think the trout spay is an intriguing space for us. Because it kind of fits, yeah. it's, we see it more and more in Montana, and it fits with our, kind of our goals of, of, you know, really making rods for trout fishing. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting to us. Yep. It is. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. So, uh, back on that bamboo. So, you know, let's start with you, Joel. Uh, you know, graphite bamboo, you know, or uh, or fiberglass, what's, what's your go-to? What, what do you like? Uh, well, it's a tough question. I, you know, I think it was really, it was really important to Tom to make all three, you know, even as a small maker, uh, because I think we feel like they all have different places. Um, depending how we're fishing and, and when we're fishing. I would say I think there's really nothing like fishing bamboo um, because for me, when I fish a bamboo rod, I always say I've got a little more swag that day. Like I get ready. I already get ready pretty slow as Matt will attest, <laughs> but I get ready a little slower. I kind of feel like, you know, I'm, I, it's a little special um, when I'm fishing them. Yeah. You know, it's certainly a purpose-driven rod. So like Matt said, we're not going to fish them when it's honking 20 on the Yellowstone and we're in a boat. You know, but if, if we're in Austin Creek yeah. and, and it's calm and, and we can see, you know, BWOs coming off the water, I don't think there's much that compares to, to casting and catching fish on bamboo, especially in lighter line weights. That seems like the bamboo, one of the cool things about bamboo is it is that slower, that nice, you know, kind of, and, but your rods already, your graphite kind of already go that route. Is there a big difference between your graphite and, and your I bamboo? I mean, there is a significant difference. I think that in the, in the world of graphite, our rods are slower than most because of that progressive action and so i think in that world they're very different but i think you know bamboo has more of an organic feel to it and i think it's hard not to fit it's hard to fish bamboo and not feel kind of a connection to the history of fly fishing you know we all grew up, yeah. grew up reading about chalk streams in england and you know all this kind of history to it um you know that being said i'd say my second favorite rod is probably a graphite rod um, because our graphite rods have such a great feel, our two-piece graphite rods, I just love fishing. Um, and they make me feel like I'm pretty much got a Swiss Army knife because I can I can nymph, target nymph to fish, I can dry fly fish, I can fish a woolly boater with them. You know, I can kind of do everything. And I just am, am at the age where I just am not good at carrying multiple rods. So, you know, so I just want to have one thing that I can kind of make work pretty well for everything. Um, and so if that's the case, R8 and F6 is probably my second favorite rod in graphite. Okay, okay, cool. It and uh, and Matt, I'll ask you what's your uh, on a different subject. What what's your uh, the music question here for you? Do you have a uh, favorite t type of music band? Anything you like to listen uh, to? I, I think if you were to walk through the shop on any given day, it's it's really up in the air. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Pandora. Be, yeah. yeah, a little bit of yeah. everything. Pandora. From, you know, heavy metal to the Grateful Dead to Radiohead to the Lumineers. I mean, it's really kind of. Yeah. I'm oh, cool. not, 
not the most musical person, but I, I like having some stuff on in the shop while we're working. We also, though, are ad- admittedly huge podcast geeks. We listen to a ton of podcasts while we're uh, working on the rods. Yeah, making rods keeps oh, nice. you up to date on all the podcasts for sure. There you go. So what's your so the your non fly fishing podcast? Do you have anything you listen to that's a favorite? That's not a uh, you know it's not in the fishing. Uh, you know, a little plug because he's a good friend. But uh, Ed Roberson's uh, Mountain and Prairie podcast. Uh, you know, he he interviews people who, in his mind, are shaping the modern West, and uh, oh, cool. it's everything from conservation to entrepreneurship and everything in between. But uh, ranching. Yeah, yeah, that's been a really cool yeah. podcast to listen to. Cool. And, uh, how, and Joel, I was going to ask you about that too, but one thing that's kind of interesting, you know, because we've never met in person, I actually haven't even seen a photo of you. I was curious, do you know Oliver White? Have you ever, you ever heard him much? Yeah. Something? Yeah. We know him a little bit. Certainly have seen him and read articles and things like that. I'm not sure my beard compares, but I, I've been well, I could tell you, I could tell you this. You sound exactly like, Oh, him. really? <laughs> Yeah, well, at least from that's the funny thing. It might be just the audio oh, here, but every time when you talk, I'm like, "Yeah, is that Oliver? Or is that just that Joel?" <laughs> yeah, I'm envious of his lifestyle. I wish I was in the, in uh, the Bahamas. <laughs> that's right. I know he's got. Well, yeah. I, well, he's going through. I think he's got a rough period with yeah, that whole true. storm. I think there. I actually started corresponding yeah. him before we bought before we bought this company about some fishing in Kamchatka, which is a bunch of oh, right. Yeah, yeah. He read some articles cool. about it, but yeah. It might be. I have a little bit of cold too, so I'm probably raspier than usual now. Oh, that's probably what it is. All right, that's probably what it is. Cool. And uh, is there anything you know? As far as I mean, obviously you guys have the class, which is cool. Any other books or uh, resources that might be good for rod building specifically? I mean, I, obviously you guys learn from the best, so maybe that's a tough question. But anything out there? Well, that are, you know, that Matt's might... better about this than me. But I, I just I think about learning in general, and the internet is such a great resource for it. I mean, I think if you have questions and you go to YouTube or just go to Google and you look up, you can find different philosophies on wrapping rods. I mean. We all the time, and, and like I said, Matt is better at it than I am, just explore, you know, to try to figure out different ways that people are doing things or different materials they're using or different solutions. Um, and it's really, it's kind of boundless, it seems like. It's really up to you if you want to, you know, be self-taught and, and look at it. And, and we're lucky, like I said, to have video examples of all these different techniques. I don't know what you'd have to add. I, but yeah, yeah. And I've, I've also found, I'm such a visual learner that obviously YouTube is great to watch something. But to me, the rod building community uh, is really gracious and, and I haven't found any space for ego in it. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, we started a group called the Bozeman Rod Builders Guild, which oh, uh, nice. once a month in the winter time and just, you know, have an adult beverage and uh, show off yep. some of the rods we've been building. Right. And uh, I'd say similarly, if you're into building, um, you know, looking on something like the classic fly rod forum or the fiber fly okay. rodders forum, but find a local builder and just don't be bashful. You know, give me a yell. Say, can I come see what you're doing in your shop? And and I, I have yet to meet someone who wouldn't give you that time to to you know improve your wrapping or your coating technique and things like that. That's cool. That that's a great tip. Yeah, you probably don't realize that, but there's probably a local builder in probably most most states or most cities, right? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. All right, you guys, I think we're about there. Any, um, uh, you know, in the next uh, six months or so, anything new coming you want to note uh, either with you guys or the, or the company? Not, not a whole lot. You know, I think one of the things is uh, Bozeman's obviously a destination. And uh, I think there's this perception that, you know, as a fly shop, you know, as a rod building shop that we're really kind of hands off. But we really have open door policy. Uh, come for a visit if you're if you're in Montana. Um, we're right off the highway here in Bozeman, and uh, we'll walk you through the shop, show you everything we've been talking about, go out and cast some rods in the front lawn, and uh, uh, we welcome visitors. So we'd we'd love to see anybody who's in the area. Yep. Yep. Okay. And we'll Perfect. be uh, we'll be at some of the fly rod or fly fishing shows this spring. So we'll be in, it'll be in Denver and New Jersey and. Marlboro, Mass, and Marlboro Pleasanton. And Pleasanton, California. So if you're in one of those locations and listening, come by and see us. Okay, great, great. So, and they can find you also online at either, uh, I guess, TomMorganRodsmith.com uh, or it's the Trout. What, what's your other site that reads? Trout Rods. Rods. Yeah, just Trout yep, Rods. Either one, or just push in Tom Morgan and Google. You'll find us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, guys. Well, hey, thanks for coming on and sharing all the uh, the information. I mean, you know, the Tom Morgan story we just touched on. I think Jerry is probably. I would love to hear more about you know her story too and that. So maybe maybe down the line we can keep in touch with you and, and get some more information there. And uh, but yeah, I appreciate you guys coming on and chatting about it. That'd today. be great. Thanks, Dave. All right, take care. Thanks. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com/slash one six one. 
Please share a link to this episode on your favorite social channel. We have grown this show 100% organically over the years, and it is that one share at a time that has allowed us to create this amazing, uh, amazing resource and, and uh, super awesome podcast. So appreciate you sharing that. Uh, just want to thank you again today for stopping by to check out the show. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you uh, on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.